Hi everyone. I'm so sorry that I'm unable to be with you in Ottawa. I'm actually in San Salvador at the moment working with local government to implement the right to housing. Many years ago, I met a woman named Naomi. This was in New Orleans and it was just after Katrina, the huge hurricane. I met Naomi outside of her destroyed home. She was African American in her 60s, physically disabled and using a wheelchair. Naomi wanted to show me her home. It was a small white bungalow with steps leading up to her front door. I offered to help her to get up the stairs, but she refused, telling me she wanted me to see her daily reality. She hoisted herself up out of the wheelchair and proceeded to drag herself up the front steps. She then made it all the way into her front hallway. It was about 45 degrees in the home and there were bugs swarming around everywhere, so much so that I couldn't even take notes for swatting the bugs away. Her floorboards were torn up and I could see right down to the foundation. There was no working toilet, no running water. She was using a dry toilet and then carting away the refuse when she could. In my opinion, it was hell. After Naomi told me her story, I asked her how she felt living in the richest country in the world in these conditions. And Naomi looked at me and without skipping a beat, she said, abandoned. This sense of abandonment is something I hear repeatedly. The idea that if you're poor and homeless, you don't count. You're invisible. In some instances, not even treated like a human being. I have heard it countless times everywhere I go. I've heard it here in Canada from my board of directors at Canada Without Poverty, from the many women I have spoken to living in shelters and by residents in the Herongate community, a community of mostly racialized people who've been displaced. The question is, how did we get here? Naomi's words have long reverberated in my head, abandoned. Abandoned by whom exactly? She had a community of support, that was obvious to me, family members and friends, community workers hauling water in and out, hauling the refuse in and out, helping her to find food. No, by abandoned she meant abandoned by government. And she's right. Governments the world over have abandoned their responsibility for housing. Let's remember that worldwide, a hundred million people are living in the streets, facing daily threats to life and security. Approximately 1.6 billion people across the world are living in informal settlements or encampments under the constant fear of, fear of being evicted and many lack basic necessities, clean water, sanitation, electricity. In North America and across Europe, homelessness is increasing in every country except Finland. In many places, the government response to homelessness is to criminalize and stigmatize people for sitting or standing in one spot or for carrying out the activities necessary for human survival, like eating and sleeping. In many places, Homelessness is directly related to the unaffordability of housing in cities. In cities across the world, including here in Canada, housing costs are skyrocketing and they are not commensurate with incomes. In the greater Toronto area, for example, in the last 30 years, housing prices have increased by 425%, whereas in the similar period, family income has grown only by 133%. In other words, housing prices have increased at three times the rate as income. Even outside of Canada's largest cities, we see this phenomenon. A minimum wage worker in almost any city in Canada can barely afford a one-bedroom apartment. A minimum wage worker in Vancouver 
would have to put in an 84 hour work week to afford the average price of a one bedroom apartment in the city or a 112 hour work week for a two bedroom apartment. And it is always the most vulnerable who are the most affected. Indigenous peoples who have historically and continue to be dis dispossessed of their lands and are subject to practices of colonialism, persons with disabilities who are, who are either institutionalized or deinstitutionalized without adequate supports, immigrants and refugees who are often low income and considered less deserving of public support, women and youth leaving violent households with nowhere to go, LGBTQ and others facing some of the most horrific forms of discrimination, and so on. And the experience is the same. People are being pushed out of their homes, their neighborhoods, and their communities. In my opinion, all of this is testament to Naomi's claim and the claim of so many others of government abandonment. In particular, their abandonment of a commitment to human rights. So again, how did we get here? I think in Canada, the generally accepted narrative within the housing sector is that in the 1990s, the federal government walked away from housing in any meaningful way. They ceased funding any new social housing while dismantling other social protections and untying social transfers to the provinces, resulting in the development and rapid rise of homelessness and housing in inadequacy and insecurity, along with other social phenomenon like the opening of food banks, all of which is still going on today. But this still doesn't exactly explain the why, like the root causes of the here and now. The root causes, in my opinion, lie in an ideology that was promulgated in the 70s and early 80s in the US by Reaganomics and Margaret Thatcher and in this country took hold in the 1980s under Prime Minister Mulroney, and which became the dominant paradigm in the 1990s under our finance minister, Paul Martin, in, a Cretchen, in the Cretchen government. And the dominant paradigm I'm talking about is, of course, neoliberalism. As you know, neoliberalism is an ideology that believes that the unregulated market will take care of basically everything, and that governments should take a big step back from social protections and supports. In the housing sector, it means reducing protections for tenants and putting in place tax incentives and other policies to allow the market to run free. And no, the irony is not lost on me. Now, when, we're, when we were staring down neoliberalism in the 1990s and the early 2000s, it looked pretty bad. I think many of us were on the front lines fighting what was then called globalization, um, and it looked pretty bad. But when you take a neoliberal system, the one in which we're currently living, and you add to it the financialization of housing, it creates the impossible and unsustainable housing conditions we're experiencing in cities around the world, including here in Canada. By financialization, I mean where housing is viewed as a commodity or a place to park excess capital, where housing is treated as a financial instrument rather than home, where it's used as leverage for more capital and to grow wealth. Of course, housing has long been financialized. We've had a mortgage-based housing system in place in Canada for a long time. 68% of people in Canada are homeowners. Mortgages are a financial product linked to housing. But that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about financialization. I'm talking about something that's actually quite new, that really emerged uh, after the global financial crisis in about 2011 and 2012. And that's where unprecedented, we, we now have unprecedented wealth in the world. And after the financial crisis, it started being parked in housing. It's, housing is now completely invaded by financial actors, by banks, pension funds, private equity firms, real estate investment trusts, shareholders, and rich individuals. 
all of whom view housing predominantly as a place to park excess capital of which there is an abundance and to turn a profit. They're buying up properties, particularly in neighborhoods they call undervalued, where affordable units still exist. Properties out of which they know they can squeeze more and more profits. Ottawa's Herringate in the East End is, an, is a very good example. Herringate is one of Ottawa's most diverse communities, home to a large number of Somali and Arab uh, families. It comprises a mix of townhouses, medium-sized buildings, and tall apartment towers. In late May of last year, the landlord, Timber Creek Communities, a multi-billion dollar asset management firm that bought up large swaths of the community a few years prior, announced plans to demolish about 150 affordable units in Herringate. The Herringate Tenants Coalition has said that this may be the single largest displacement of tenants in Canada's history. Timber Creek, which operates in 27 cities across Canada, as well as in other countries around the world, said that the townhouses were no longer viable and gave the tenants eviction notices. In the face of eviction and possible homelessness, Binto Mohammed, one of the residents, said, there's a piece of me missing because of the stress. When Timber Creek rebuilds the community, there is no certainty that the units will be affordable and the re that the residents will be able to return. This is the new housing landscape, where the owner is a financial actor and the client is an investor, not the tenant. There are, of course, other manifestations of the financialization of housing, such as short-term rental platforms like Airbnb and HomeAway and Bookings.com, which result in the increase in the development of luxury accommodations and the reduction of available housing stock that could be used for long-term affordable rentals. The impact of all of this is that people are being pushed out of their homes and their neighborhoods and communities. Rents are rising. People are being evicted in greater numbers and sometimes falling into homelessness. Existing stock is deteriorating. New stock is luxury or high end and for investors, not for tenants. So where is government in all of this? All of this is happening quite legally through financial structures that governments have helped to create and have failed to regulate. While governments have abandoned tenants, rest assured, they have not abandoned investors. And the importance of that relationship between governments and investors cannot be underestimated. Who are some of Canada's biggest invest investors in residential real estate? Pension funds. And of course, pension funds play a hugely important role in terms of the wealth and stability of our economy. In fact, what we all need to kind of get our heads around is that housing or residential real estate is now big business. In fact, it's the big, biggest business of all businesses. It is now valued at 163 trillion US dollars, which none of us knows what that means really. We shall shake our heads, 163 trillion dollars. What does that mean? The only thing I can compare it to is GDPs. If you take the entire world's GDP and multiply that by 2.5, you end up with about 163 trillion US dollars. In Canada, real estate drove one fifth of the Canadian economy in 2017. In other words, housing as a commodity is integral to economies, including the Canadian economy, to business and to the financial worlds. So now you know what we're up against when we say we want to end homelessness and ensure access to adequate housing and affordable housing for everyone. In my opinion, this means we can't just tinker with programs and policies to address this. We need something more. I think it's really important to note that the decision of governments to support this model of housing as a commodity or housing as an investment and the complementary decision to withdraw conceptually and in practice from housing as a social good cannot be regarded as just any old po policy decision.
Housing is not like any old commodity, like steel. Steel is a commodity. Housing is not. Housing is a human right. It's a human right that governments around the world, including governments in Canada, have committed to. Unfortunately, housing as a place of warmth and security and love, of shared stories, of memories, of growing families, is losing its currency. I want to remind you that this has not always been the case, at least not in Canada. In the 60s and 70s, housing was viewed as providing personal security, but not necessarily wealth. Governments played an active role through legislation and policy to ensure that a variety of housing options were available for diverse household incomes, home ownership, rental accommodation, public or subsidized housing were all options. Homelessness and the unaffordability of housing as known now did not really exist and certainly not on today's scale. Without painting too rosy a picture, I think I can say housing was generally understood as a social good. It was aligned with the understanding that housing is a human right for all, a place to live in dignity. So I guess then that leaves us with the question, so how do we get back there? What I've been saying, and I guess I'll, I'll, I will be saying this for some time, but I think what's required is a seismic paradigmatic shift. The shift would affirm that deprivations of the right to adequate housing are not just program failures or policy challenges, but rather are human rights violations of the highest order, depriving those affected of the most basic human right to dignity, security, and to life itself. A shift would recognize that housing can no longer be understood as a commodity or an asset or a place to grow wealth, but must be embraced as a social good necessary <clears throat> for the well-being of individuals and society alike. But more than anything, if we're going to solve homelessness and grossly inadequate housing in countries around the world and to address affordability issues, we need governments to show up, all levels of government, and they need to show up in ways that they have long abandoned and to show up in new ways to counter the very sophisticated and deeply entrenched causes of housing unaffordability and inadequate housing. We are starting to see this shift being embraced, particularly at the local level by mayors. In Montreal, for example, there's a new regulation requiring developers to include social and affordable and family housing in all projects that include five units or more. The city has increased its target for affordable and social housing from 15% to 20% of the total housing stock. In Barcelona this summer, Mayor Ada Colau um, expropriated a building that had been abandoned and has converted it into uh, affordable housing. And the government has announced that it will do so with another seven properties. In Berlin, just this week, the government negotiated a rent freeze for five years on existing units where the, and where the rent is more than 30%, the tenant can apply to have their rent, sorry, where the rent is more than 30% of a tenant's income, the tenant can apply to have that rent reduced uh, to a reasonable rate. Now, I think all of these sorts of initiatives are incredibly important, but I'm concerned. I'm concerned that a piecemeal approach and this sort of one little policy here, one little policy there, is actually not going to address what's at play here. I think governments actually need to adopt comprehensive human rights based housing strategies to address the global nature and, and, and the, uh, the global actors that are involved in housing right now. They need, governments need an overarching framework that can be implemented and that will result in structural change that would prevent homelessness and that would reduce affordability issues. I think Canada is moving in this direction. 
Let me just explain why I think human rights are so essential to housing strategies, and this is the move the Government of Canada has recently made to adopt a rights-based housing strategy here and to adopt legislation in this regard. First of all, if you think about what homelessness is about or grossly inadequate housing, evictions, what it's like to be stereotyped or stigmatized as uh, someone living in social housing or on the streets, all of those phenomena are assaults on dignity and they threaten security in life. They challenge what it means to be human. These are human rights concerns and they should therefore trigger human rights responses. Human rights also change the way governments interact with people who are homeless or inadequately housed, recognizing them not as beneficiaries of charity but rather as rights holders, as active subjects empowered to engage and be involved in decisions that affect their lives. A rights-based approach clarifies who is accountable to whom. All levels of government are accountable to people, particularly marginalized and vulnerable groups. And lastly, human rights incorporate universal norms which bring coherence and coordination to multiple areas of law and policy through a common purpose and a shared set of values. And it's for this reason that I have partnered with an international network of cities as well as with the United Nations to start a new global movement called The Shift. It's a movement aimed at reclaiming housing as a human right. And the aim is to bring together diverse sectors, city governments, national governments, civil society organizations, academics, architects, development organizations, the private sector. The shift recognizes that a global response is necessary to this global phenomenon and the global entities and forces behind it. And it's challenging us to change how we think. We need to recognize that this is a different fight than we have had before, and that it's going to require different tools and different strategies. It's not just about getting more money to flow to housing. Uh, it's not just about building more social housing. It's much, much bigger than that. That's why I got involved in the documentary film Push, which some of you may have seen. I wanted to reach out to diverse audiences. I wanted to start new conversations. I want to provoke. If you haven't seen PUSH, you'll get to see it in Ottawa at the Bytown between the 4th and 7th of October. But in the meantime, I want you to consider what you can do on an individual basis to try to address this new housing landscape. Here's my to-do list. First, think twice before you rent an Airbnb on your next vacation. Find out if Airbnb or whatever short-term rental platform you're using is regulated in the city you're visiting before you book. Ask your pension fund if they invest in residential real estate, and if they do, ask them not to. It's now common for employees to ask pension funds not to contribute to climate change through their investments. We need to start asking our pension funds to stop making investments in residential real estate that's leading to the eviction of tenants, the unaffordability of housing and homelessness. Three, when you see a homeless person on the street, for example, see that person as the result of the commodification of housing and the failure of governments to effectively implement the right to housing and then go tell your friends and neighbors to do the same thing. And lastly, start asking public officials why the right to housing isn't included in any legislation in your province or any bylaw in your city. Or if you're a public official, become part of the solution. Agitate for new laws and policies. I guess ultimately what I'm asking you to do is to find your outrage. Don't accept the unacceptable. Push back.
more than 235,000 homeless people in a country with the 10th largest GDP and the fastest growing economy of the G7, that's Canada, is not acceptable. It's shameful. Canada is a rich and sophisticated country and can do and must do much better than this. We have to stop government's abandonment of people and stop their abandonment of human rights. Thank you.